The voluntarist philosophy has at its foundation two principles from which the ethical nature of any and all human action is determined. The first of these two is the principle of self-ownership, which states that we are the exclusive controllers and therefore owners of our own sovereign bodies. And by extension, we also own our actions and the effects of those actions. From this line of reasoning, we are able to derive the criteria for legitimate property acquisition and titling. In short, property may only be acquired through the acts of original appropriation or voluntary contractual exchange. Now the second principle is that of non-aggression, otherwise known as the NAP. This principle grants each person the natural right to live free of coercive or aggressive interference by another individual. Coercion here is defined as the explicit application or threat of harm to a person's body or property by another human being. From this principle, we may conclude that for an act to be considered criminal requires a victim of coercion as previously defined. In short, if there is no victim, then there may be no crime. Hello everyone and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Christopher Chase Rachels coming in from Asheville, uh, North Carolina. He's an anarcho-capitalist, peaceful parenter of a 13-month-old boy. Uh, and he's a future unschooler, uh, although he would tell you that he's already unschooling <laughs> because <laughs> education happens since birth, right? It's always happening. We're always yeah. learning. Um, <laughs> and he's a co-founder of the Blue Ridge Liberty Project, um, author and author of uh, the book A Spontaneous Order, The Capitalist Case for a Stateless Society, uh, which I'm reading right now. Very awesome book. Highly recommend it. We'll get into that. And, um, and his, he's a host of ANCAP Radio. And also, uh, he has a, a podcast, First Degree Liberty, with Mike Martelli. Uh, so the, the website is, is uh, brlp.org for the Blue Ridge Liberty Project. And his website for the book is not yet up, uh, but it will be quite soon. It'll be aspontaneousorder.com. Uh, and his YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ancap chase that's actually how i found him a couple of years ago i'm uh, very grateful for that puts up some awesome content there so check that out and uh and, and facebook you can find the blue ridge uh liberty project as just that name blue ridge liberty project so um uh, very cool um christopher thanks a lot for coming on the show yes thank you for having me danilo it's a great pleasure to be here yeah so uh yeah so i i heard about your work uh you know a few years ago through the uh, ancap chase and uh I never actually knew who you were because you never showed your face, right? <laughs> your videos, right? It's, it's always <laughs> That's right. Uh, just your voice. So I never knew who you were, even uh, even on Facebook. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> and, and then finally, <laughs> finally, I put the name. Oh, Chase and Kev Chase. Ah, yeah. it makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very cool. So uh, yeah, so I love your work. I've been following you for a while. I've re you know, I've learned a lot from it. So and now I'm you know continuing to learn from your book. So that's really awesome. Um, so before we get into that, um, can you give us a little bit of history? Uh, regarding your background, you know, how you came to anarcho-capitalism and, uh, and peaceful parenting. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, um, like many other ANCAPs, I started off as a neoconservative. And in 2008, I just graduated high school and I joined the military. And around that same time, I also discovered Ron Paul running his uh, 2008 campaign. And I loved everything about Ron Paul with the exception of foreign policy. So because of that, I did a little more research and reading and realized he was pretty on target with the foreign policy as well. And after that, it was just a gradual progression to becoming progressively more libertarian. I read a lot of Andrew Napolitano uh, stuff. I became more of a constitutionalist, minarchist, and then finally... Once I got out of the military, I started reading a lot more about Austrian economics, studying a lot more in Mises.org, and Stefan Molyneux was even actually helpful to get me transitioning from minarchy to anarchy. And uh, since then, uh, I tr probably was an ANCAP in 2011 is when it actually happened, and since then I've just been trying to increase my knowledge and research more and read more. and. Uh, that's kind of what inspired me to write this book because I realized that there are so many 
different things and questions I had, and I couldn't find one single book that had uh, referenced every single one of the common objections and, and common critiques. So I kind of wanted to create a product that wasn't already existing in the market and put that out there. Yeah, that's a that's a great reason to to write something. Uh, you know, like the book you wrote. It's like it's like you know what I want to find this type of book, but it's yeah. not there. So let me just write it. <laughs> I'm just yeah. gonna write it for those people <laughs> that maybe are in my position, right? Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. But but yeah, it's great. I'm I'm uh, I'm currently reading. I'm like halfway through it. It's very thorough, very um, informative. You know, it's um, yeah, it's really really awesome book. Um, you know, it's uh, takes apart. You know, in quite exquisite detail the uh, you know Austrian economics theory um, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah yeah so I highly recommend it so um, cool so so yeah so w what about the the Blue Ridge Liberty Project how did that uh, come about just I'm just curious uh, if you can share a little bit of the background with that right so um, I met Justin Stout when arrived right in the military I, um, I went to uh, University of South Carolina for a semester I was going for uh, my political science degree and I met Justin Stout, and he was into Ron Paul too, but he was also at the time a voluntarist, and he's the one who kind of introduced me to voluntarism and her capitalism. And uh, it was an idea that I wanted to believe in, but I just didn't think it'd be practical. But, you know, after doing a lot more research, I found that it was actually not just practical, but much more practical than the state is. So he had for a long time had this idea of starting a southern version of the FSP but not even just like the FSP but also more focused like instead of being just more liberty just less government we want this to be explicitly um, voluntarist with a special emphasis on peaceful parenting as well so um, after I had known for about a year or so we ended up choosing Asheville as what we thought to be the perfect location to start this project uh, we liked the culture up there we thought it was very conducive to these ideas. People there are, renowned, are known for thinking outside the box, for being very peaceful. Um, the, cult, the culture there is also very much into the homeschooling stuff. They're much into the pe uh, peaceful parenting stuff already. Uh, there's a lot of agorism that goes on there, even though most of them wouldn't know that it goes by that name, but it happens. Um, the mountains are great. Lush, beautiful soil. I mean, I could just go on and on with all the reasons we loved Asheville. And uh, we put it. We decided to make the project there, and uh, we think it's been a great success so far. We're really excited to see where it's going to continue to um, take us, and it's going to continue to grow. And uh, we're just kind of along for the ride, and and we're just looking forward to tomorrow, seeing what comes our way. And of course, we're becoming much more active and organized as each day passes. So we're really excited. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I really like the idea of, uh, of you know, people, like people of like mind, you know, coming together and, and you know, un uniting with a common cause like that because, you know, it's one thing to, to live, you know, maybe where you grew up or, um, you know, where you went to school and having the friends there that you had since childhood. And then once you change your philosophy, <laughs> it mm -hmm. becomes kind of uh, difficult to continue those relationships. You know, you would like to, but it's just like you begin to clash, right, too much. And you're like, damn it, now things ha something has to give, you know. <laughs> <It's>, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, you're, you're exactly correct. And it's unfortunate because many people who are into uh, voluntarism or peaceful, and peaceful parenting, because I... I personally believe they go very much hand in hand. Um, the people who are into those things tend to be like the only one or one of two in their town, and they just crave community and more social interaction. So because there's not other people like that where they live, they're forced to settle for people who don't share all their values who maybe aren't so much in the peaceful parenting or aren't so much in the volunteerism. Maybe they have one part of the picture but not the other. So we want to do um, create a little sanctuary, if you will, to where people wouldn't have to sacrifice community to uh, live their beliefs, live their values, and to be able to talk about them openly. You know, unfortunately, most people feel like censored in most situations because they know if they talk very openly about um, one of these issues, because they're not very popular, that they're going to be sacrificing their community and be ostracized to a small degree. So we really were excited about the community, but also what, what goes along with having more people in a concentrated area is there's many more opportunities to synergize efforts for various activist ends. 
So it's just really cool. Uh, it's pretty cool all around, and uh, I'm I'm very happy with how it's turned out, and I'm really excited to see where it's going in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, uh, yeah, you're right. The the chilling effect where you know you want to you know you're learning about these awesome ideas and you want to share them, but then at the same time, if, if you become vocal with the, those around you that are not that don't share those ideas, then yeah, the ostracism mm -hmm. can occur where they just shun you because you just seem so eccentric <laughs> like, oh yeah like wait a minute we should we should apply the same morality to government that we wait that's too weird <laughs> yep <laughs> all right yeah it's too much logical consistency for some people <laughs> right right everybody has grown up with the double standard you know legal plunder right you know what mm -hmm. if it's taxation it's not immoral right because it's taxation right I mean, you just gotta change you change the word it just makes it moral. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, yeah. Once you enter the uh, the status institution, you enter the public sphere. Morality just kind of stands on its head, and it's just completely backwards. So. Right, right, right. So yeah, that's really yeah. It's really great that um, that you guys want to want to change. You know, you want to you want to get together with other like minded people because it's right. You know, it's like it's like you know we we can affect change. You know, scattered. And, you know, one by one, those around us. But then you're right. Once we come together, our message is that much more powerful and focused, right? And then we, right. su we support each other and then even better. So, yeah, such an awesome idea. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so so uh, so let's get into your book a little bit. Um, so, like, you, you go into the various... Um, like different aspects of uh, of Austrian economics, right? Uh, like contract and banking, things like that. So, yeah, can you, can you get into a little bit of those? Yeah, I, I do. It, it's pretty much a fusion, not of just Austrian economics, but also a lot of libertarian philosophy, of course, mm -hmm. and a, a political theory. Because Austrian economics itself, it's value-free. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just tells you how the economy works but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily entail a certain um, political order right it just says if you do X then Y will happen mm. so you really need to have a fusion of the two uh, in order to make a case for a particular social order which of course I'm I'm arguing for a um, voluntarist or anarcho capitalist social order and yes you're absolutely right I, I start from the very foundation with the epistemology and praxeology and those are like the basis of Austrian economics and then I I move on to uh, prove the private property ethic or uh, what we know as a libertarian ethic that is private property rights and the non-aggression principle and I, I utilize Hans Hermann Hoppe's argumentation ethics to help me do this so we're not just making people accept the NAP and private property on face value but I'm actually giving them a, a rational proof which shows the validity and the soundness of these concepts and then I move on to property, talking about what it is and what it's not. And then to contracts, what are, what are enforceable valid contracts, what wouldn't be considered enforceable contracts. And then money and banking, insurance, uh, health care, uh, monopolies and cartels. And then I really I move into applications, like I already said, healthcare. But we also look into how law and order might function and why it might be more efficient and ethical. Of course, same thing with defense and security, uh, as well as education, environmentalism, uh, poverty, roads. Of course, you got to have the roads in there. <laughs> um, and I also go take a chapter to look at the corporation itself because I think there's a lot of misconceptions regarding uh, what a corporation is. Mm. And then finally, uh, I end the book off with a chapter on getting there, which includes what I believe to be the most effective um, means that we can actually uh, achieve this free society, which I talk about and make a case for in the book. So I, I think it's I think it's probably one of the most comprehensive works out there. And I try to make it comprehensive without sacrificing a lot of the um, the thoroughness for making the argument, the rigor of the argument of the case for each of those things. So it, it's it's a it's a very delicate balance to to be thorough yet concise and not have like a thousand page tome at the end of it. So <laughs> I, I hope I I hope I accomplish that end. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. So so um like I'm just curious, um, any any objections that people have had, like uh, reading that, or, or or you know, just you people around you that you you talk about volunteerism and 
and anarcho capitalism like uh, like some people have told you like um you know you know come on come on chase you're just being too utopian you're idealistic okay this is this is un- <laughs> this can happen come back to the real world like do people <laughs> some people say that to you well it, it's it's funny you mention that because i think my father is probably my my harshest critic and he <laughs> and he himself is is a minarchist oh, so wow. he he's you know a self-proclaimed libertarian but again he's he's a very harsh critic and in fact He's a pretty smart guy, so he probably makes some of the most sophisticated critiques of anarcho-capitalism or anarchy in general. Mm-hmm. So his critiques have really kind of inspired the book in, the, in many ways because it got me thinking about not just – I don't want to just address all the softball objections to anarcho-capitalism. I, w- I want to address the toughest, most sophisticated objections. Mm-hmm. That way the case is very ironclad. So just about any – common objection or very um, hard objection to anarchy I could think of has pretty much been addressed in the book. And if someone has objections even still, uh, when they realize I have this book out there, they probably haven't, haven't read it. So, I mean, I, I haven't yet come across an objection that's not addressed in the book. I'll just put it that way. And I'm sure there's some out there, but I, I haven't encountered it yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's kind of funny that uh, you know the people that um, you know are pro government. They when when we begin to you know it like it's it's okay to criticize the government, right? It's okay to say you know Obama's uh, health care sucks, right? Or you know we oh, need yeah. tax reform, or we need you know education reform. That's acceptable. But then once you say you go a little bit further, and you're like, you know what? Maybe we should get the government out of everything. Maybe it's completely <laughs> inefficient. Maybe we don't need it at all. And then I'm like, oh my God, you are you are a crazy, you're a wacko, you're a fanatic, you're off your <laughs> you know, go back to your medications. <laughs> um, oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you you get that? Yeah, everyone wants to shrink the cancer, but no one wants to eliminate it. Right. Yeah, uh, and um, you know, along that same vein. Uh, I think it's very easy for many people to identify what are the quote-unquote issues of society, what are the problems, and many people more or less are pretty on point when it comes to what are the issues. However, very, very few people um, can offer us a coherent solution or superior alternative in order to deal with these issues. They just know this is bad, but they very, very rarely can give us what's better. So I wanted the the book to be very solution oriented. I do talk about the state and its and its um, weaknesses and its flaws very much in the book, but only so I can contrast them with the superior alternative that is um, voluntarism, anarcho capitalism, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's very important. We don't want to just be anti X, Y, or Z. We want to be pro A, B, and C too. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to we want to show people we want X, not just we don't want Y. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. People want to he- want to hear solutions. They don't want to hear complaints. And one thing that mm-hmm. um, I remember when I first got in- got into this uh, this stuff, maybe a few years ago, um, my mother, who is uh, quite a, a, a passionate, uh, she calls herself a social democrat slash cons- progressive slash um, socialist. <laughs> she's yeah, quite, she's quite proud of that. And, uh, and one, of the, <laughs> one of the things she's like, she says to me is, in your anarchy society how would x work so basically the first the first problem with that is i'm like well first of all it's not my society (laughs) okay i'm not the dictator i'm not the emperor okay (laughs) i don't make these decisions that's the whole idea of not having a ruling class right not having Mm -hmm. not having government is that is that you know things are decided based on market demand right based on consumer choice right mm. and uh and that's beautiful and that's what brings about you know the unforeseen advances in progress and wealth it's created when entrepreneurs you know innovate right <laughs> like you can't predict that you can't put a gun to somebody's head and say make an iphone <laughs> absolutely it, right invention creation doesn't happen like that right <laughs> yeah i think it's because they're just they're they're so used to this method of analyzing different types of social order because they, they never really considered a stateless social order. So whenever yeah. they ask, well, who would do this? Who right. would do that? <laughs> they're, they're in that central planning mindset because yeah. all every other social order, it's always some form of central blueprint. Oh, well, you know, the Department of Transportation is going to handle the roads and the Department of Justice is going to handle the, right. you know, the law and order or what, whatever. Uh-huh. So, um, that's why when I have a chapter on each of these issues, I, I'm not sitting there saying, 
the roads are going to be funded and constructed in exactly this way and mm -hmm. they're going to run exactly that. But what I do is instead is I, I say here is economically why a free market environment will produce a more efficient um, setup and of course do do so in a more ethical way. I just I just show them the economics of why it would be better but as far as the specific form it would take like you said if we can know that in advance that'd be an argument for central planning for statism <laughs> not for anarchy it's it's precisely because mm -hmm. we cannot know in advance what's the optimum way to actually provide these services uh, that we need the market, that we need the prices to help show us if we're satisfying consumer demands or not, that we need the profit and loss system, and and really, it's 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 the it's humility, it's 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 accepting and being and having that humility which allows us to see that okay, maybe not one person or a small group of people know what's best for everyone else. Maybe we should let the bottom up process of the market organically show us what's the best way to do things right right yeah like uh i i uh <clears throat> i was talking about democracy recently on, on one of my posts on facebook and and what this one person said um you know so you hate democracy so much what do you what do you want a dictatorship you want one person <laughs> you want one person uh, deciding for, and it's like it's like it's like well <laughs> if you go to a restaurant and you, you don't want everybody voting what everybody should eat right one thing we want one person <laughs> voting what everybody should eat <laughs> and so the idea that no actually individuals can make their own choices does not even come into their mind like like you said like every single social order you know everything every single ism mm -hmm. is force right is yeah. government coercion mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the only thing that's not is Anarch anarchy or or statelessness or right right <laughs> or volunteerism that's the only thing that lacks the co that coercion and people uh they it's just way off their radar <laughs> oh yeah absolutely and, and the funny thing is is you know in a, in a sense in a free market you you are voting but you're voting with your dollars right right in the number of votes you have so to speak mm. is directly proportional to how much you previously produced mm -hmm. because the more productive you are the more money you get the more quote unquote votes you get yeah. so the impact in the in the the impact you have on the direction of the market is directly correlated to how productive you've been and how productive you've been just means it's just short shorthand for how much value you've added to society how much you've taken some goods that were valued less separately the some of them are valued less separately when you put them together they're they're valued more than the sum of their individual parts like you you literally created value you produced value that wasn't there beforehand so it, it's a it's a beautiful system and the market's very fickle people are very fickle mm. uh, you're not going to be able to produce the same product forever and be incredibly profitable and again because we have the market and the pricing mechanism it allows us to mold and shape and be fluid and evolve according with the ever-changing whims of the consumer so it's not only does it satisfy all of our desires now but provides a way in which we can continue to satisfy people's changing desires in the future in relation to what what we have access to it's it's incredible it's beautiful yeah and and what what's uh, what's interesting to me is that when we when we talk about um the immorality of government and ruling class and <clears throat> and how you know people should be free um people equate like what do you want to go back to um you know caveman times you want to go back to like, <laughs> living in the woods you know primitivism and things like that and <laughs> so basically what they're doing is they're associating progress technological progress and intelligence and philosophy and economics and every single you know piece of knowledge that people have discovered to government like government mm -hmm. was responsible for all of that mm -hmm. <laughs> and if we didn't have that we would be back in the barbaric times right <laughs> yeah well i think rothbard had a very pertinent quote that went along those lines and, and he said something to the effect and i'm paraphrasing here but he said that the greatest non sequitur committed by defenders of the state is to say that the necessity of civilization um is what makes the state necessary. Like basically, that mm -hmm. if you want civilization, you need the state. You can't have civilization without the state, and that's a complete non sequitur. Like right. it doesn't follow that we want civilization, therefore a state. That that doesn't follow. <laughs> you, you can have a civilization without the state. In fact, I would argue, of course, just like I'm sure you would, that uh -huh. 
we would have a, a much more civilized civilization <laughs> without the state, a, a much less even chaotic civilization without the state, even though the irony is, is that the anarchists are viewed as advocates for chaos and destruction and uh, opponents to civilization. Right, yeah, and, and that's the whole idea with taxation. It's your civic duty. You know, you want to contribute your fair share. We live in a civilized society. Of course you're going to pay taxes. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, and exactly what you said. I'm like, well, if, <clears throat> if the definition of a civilized society is that you know there's a there's a ruling class that's exempt from the the laws of morality that everyone else is subject to and they can arbitrarily dictate the laws and taxes that are imposed on that majority by threat of punishment and violence i would mm-hmm. say actually that's an uncivilized that's actually a barbaric society <laughs> that's a primitive oh, yeah. society right there you're not living off of, you know you're not living by intelligence and creativity you're just living by brute force mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that's the appeal to the stick <laughs> Oh yeah, well, and of course that that section of society, um, this the state itself, can only live parasitically off of those mm-hmm. who rely upon their intelligence and productivity to produce value for others on a voluntary basis. So yeah, they're they're only holding us back. It's just a big obstacle, and that parasite just grows ever more large until our civilization implodes and we start from scratch. Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. that's happened time and time again. Right, and that's, the, and that's the problem is that, you know, that how many revolutions have there been and collapses and wealth transfers and hyperinflations and they don't seem to get it. They don't, you know, people don't look back in history and say, wait a minute, I think this happened before. <laughs> Maybe we should try something different this time. No, they're oh, like, yeah. Who's, who should rule next? <laughs> who are we going to yeah. put into power? <laughs> well, unfortunately, they, they do try different things sometimes, but they're always different forms of states. They're right. never right, right, right. saying, maybe the premise is flawed. Maybe, we don't, maybe it's not that we don't have the right state, but maybe we don't need the state at all. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I think, I think we'll make it there eventually, but as far as when that will be, I guess no one knows. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and just you know the idea that um, I, you know I tell people we're not you know anarchists or volunteers are not fortune tellers. We're not oracles. We can't predict the future, right? All mm-hmm. that all that we really know, and all that I think that it's important to know is that you know something is moral or immoral, right? That's that's that to me that's that's the crux, uh, crux of the whole argument. And if you mm-hmm. can determine that the government is the essence of immorality and that it's fundamentally inefficient and wasteful and unnecessary <laughs> that we can do away with it and actually be more prosperous we don't need to know you know what kind of roads will be built we don't need to know how you know we're going to get around you know what cars or what planes or mm-hmm. maybe we won't even need cars we'll have we'll have teleportation <laughs> maybe we would have had that you know decades ago who knows <laughs> if the market yeah, does not help back <laughs> yeah and I, and I think the um the objection that gets put forth to that all too often is, okay, well, maybe the government isn't the pinnacle of morality. However, it's conducive to achieving some more utilitarian ends, some more practical ends. And really, you can't really separate what's moral from what's practical. I mean, on the net, you're going to have much more even material prosperity by adhering to the non-aggression principle, by respecting private property rights. And you're going to be having more individual prosperity by not being an antisocial asshole, you know, by forming <laughs> networks, by being empathetic, by, by always sticking true to your word, by not committing fraud. I mean, these, these are all things which aren't just moral, they're practical. And, and I, I think they're really two sides of the same coin. Right, right. And, and the other thing that, that kind of, uh, for me, um, is, is very significant is the fact that, you know, the market forces that determine what business will survive and what will perish uh, are mm-hmm. completely turned upside down when government coercion is introduced. You know, there is no market, you know, when the Department of Education hijacks education and, 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 and you know, forces people to go or forces people to fund it, regardless if yes. you go or not. And, and, and so w- what is the incentive? Is the incentive to, to have better and better teachers? Or <laughs> to for the quality to just plummet, right? And, oh, it's it's the opposite, yeah. Right, exactly. So, and and that you know basically on every you know every single government program just go down the line. You know, Federal Reserve, the, the Department of Transportation, Department of Justice, you know, EPA, <laughs> anything mm-hmm. you can think of. You know, once once force is required to fund it, and people are no longer given the choice to opt out or to boycott it, 
then they don't really need to care about how they treat people, right? Or, or their quality well, yeah. of service, right? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the moral hazard, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if the funding is guaranteed, then what's the incentive? So at that point, their only incentive really is to just maintain some superficial level of popularity. You know, so that is much easier to do than to actually continue persuading people to be a patron of the service, right? So when your funding is guaranteed, yeah, like you said, they're in the in the advantageous position to where if their services suck, they'll be like, hey, obviously our services suck, so we need more money to make them better. <laughs> right. And if they're great, they're like, look, we have a successful program. Our services are great. Reward us with more money. <laughs> you know, no matter what happens, they're always going to get more money. Right. 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 Yeah, exactly. Completely perverted market forces, and yeah, yeah. So, and something like that would never, you know, never, uh, it would never survive in in the market. Like, you know, I tell people, you know, uh, is it, let's say somebody's a business owner. I'm like, do you think if your business fails, you're going to get a bailout? Right. <laughs> and why is that? <laughs> why will you not get a bailout? And why will that bailout instead go to you know J.P. Morgan Chase, Capital One, Bank of America? You know. Yep. Um, you know, BP or Monsanto or whatever. And, yeah. and, and, and the difference is, do they offer any value to society compared to what you are offering? You know, you, you are being, you know, most of your stuff is volu voluntarily acquired. But, mm. you know, <clears throat> I mean, I guess Monsanto in a certain sense, you know, people voluntarily <laughs> seek buy their stuff. But, but for the most part, I think, you know, remove the subsidies, remove the favoritism, remove the regulatory capture, and they just collapse. They can't survive in the, in the market, um, without it <laughs> yeah and even if they didn't collapse they of course wouldn't be nearly as profitable yeah. as they as they are and that we can say that for certain yeah like 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 i i like to think that uh i, I forget who said this but um you know if you remove all the guns and all the violence from the government you know all that's left is a as a crappy is a, is a crappy business with a inferior product that nobody wants to buy <laughs> <laughs> i think that's true of a lot of uh businesses out there yeah right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so so yeah so it just uh it doesn't add up, um, but uh, but 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 let me ask you, um, like w with your family, how how does your your family? I know you mentioned your father, but um, like, uh, are you, you have brothers and sisters? Are they uh, are they uh, like how do they feel regarding libertarianism and and anarchy? Well, like I said, my dad is ironically probably the closest to me ideologically. Like he he identifies as a libertarian or minarchist, if you will. <laughs> My brother, he's very apathetic. He couldn't care less. But he is an army veteran, uh, and he's very proud of America. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so he's kind of he's kind of a nationalist. Wow. I mean. So you know, I don't think that he would in any way uh, care about libertarianism. Yeah. Same thing with my stepmother, with my my own mother. She's a you know good old fashioned Republican. <laughs> so I mean. Right, right, right. Uh, no one other than myself is really into volunteerism in my extended family, yeah. and my dad is probably the closest. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's really amazing how you know how we we come through these realizations, and we learn about philosophy and economics. And uh, certain people are interested, and certain people just don't care, <laughs> or they just yeah. don't want their 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 sacred cows destroyed. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to threaten their government cheese. <laughs> Right, and I was uh, I, I was talking to to Bill Bupert uh, a couple of weeks back, and he was saying that you know sacred cows make the best burgers. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. So um, yeah. So I mean, I mean that's the thing with 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 um, you know with most people, if you if you have the humility to accept that your previous beliefs were wrong, and that that's the only way that you can improve yourself, right? And and mm -hmm. and become smarter and increase your intelligence, right? Is is if mm -hmm. you can accept, you know what? Maybe what I was thinking yesterday wasn't altogether correct maybe this is better you know and i think that's a very humble it's a humble admission right that that you know we don't know everything and maybe we we're continue learning every, every day we're learning something new right and and to think that some people just get stuck like they have a wall they build the wall and they're like that's it i'm done <laughs> i'm not learning anything new <laughs> after today like it's i don't know it's um it just seems uh yeah, like you said, I guess some people are just apathetic. Some people are just scared, maybe, of a, the possibility mm -hmm. that you know the the single the single most uh, uh, you know the biggest agency of oppression is not you know people in turbans and sandals you know across an ocean you know <laughs> that live oh, yeah. in, that live in a desert. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, 
they're here at home and they call themselves the government. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, about the apathetic people, you really can't do much about. Unfortunately, you know, no matter what you produce or do, they don't care. They don't care. But hopefully, those who are who do care and who genuinely want to remedy a lot of these complex social issues we're faced with and have an open mind are going to be the ones who, like you said, are humble enough to uh, accept these ideas. And I hope those people who are willing to read and consume my book, I think that would help with just about anyone. I, I pretty much can't imagine anyone reading it and not being more libertarian than they were when they started. That is, if they're not already an ANCAP or a <laughs> voluntarist. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's, that's pretty cool. Um, like you said, for me, I used to be a neocon. And so that's, that's a radical shift from neocon to where I am today. And for most of us, I, I think very, very small percentage of us started out from anarchy. Well, I mean, technically, I guess we're babies. But, mm-hmm. you know, like from like uh, when we can actually think about politics, or I think most of us started from the state and had to let that go. And for anyone, that's a radical shift, no matter who you are. So, yeah, humility is the key. Yeah, you know, I firmly believe that, that uh, you know, we're all born anarchists. Uh, we, we don't recognize authority figures um, and that we have a, we have a, a basic innate understanding of, of private property. You know, by, you know, the simple things that toddlers say, you know, it's mine. You know, you said you said so. Um, I got it. For, I got it first. Right. I think these are like yeah. implied verbal contracts. Like, you know, if you said that, you know, this is yours and then you say, no, and actually now it's mine. And they're going to say, no, you said it's mine. <laughs> Uh, right so yes, in, yes. In, in that way i think that you know we're all born anarchists but uh kind of get beat it's get, gets beaten out of us through uh you know authoritarian parenting spanking um and then later on uh you know punishment and also and then, and then through uh government schooling uh yes. indoctrination so <laughs> 12 years of that absolutely <laughs> yeah 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 like uh um yeah, I think it was it was Stalin that said like you know give me your child for four years and this is the seed I planted would never be uprooted, um, mm-hmm. and that's only four years, right? And today we have twelve years. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true for most people, and you know I even went to the military for four years after that, so I got a very large heaping dose of status propaganda. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's really amazing. You know, yeah, when I when I meet other um veterans, veteran volunteers, or you know, veterans that are volunteers or anarchists, I'm I mean, that's really that's really a, an amazing leap to take because that's I mean, being a being a soldier is, or or I guess same thing with the police is like one of the most nationalistic things that you can do. Oh <laughs> you yeah. You sac- you're actually sacrificing your your you not only your time but your life possibly for your country, right? For nationalism. <laughs> oh yeah, for at least what you believe right, <laughs> is right, your right. country. Yeah. So, so were you were you um, like very influenced by nine eleven? Is is that what what uh, wanted you to you know in, in uh, impelled you to join the military? No, actually, uh, I didn't really have very nationalistic motivations. They're more just uh, I guess they're more self interested ones. I I like the idea that I pay for my school after I get out. I uh, thought it'd be good to uh, build my confidence and gain some cool skills along the way. Um, so I was never really very nationalistic, I guess. Um, and I think that's kind of what helped me stay open to these new libertarian ideas and what helped me, um, give Ron Paul a a, a fair chance, even with the foreign policy, which I initially disagreed with. So I was always the, the very libertarian. I was actually, I was an intelligence analyst in the military, in the air force, so I was always a very obnoxious libertarian guy in the room talking about, do we really have the, the authority, the just authority to do this, to collect these cell phone transmissions? Should we be going to war with these guys? Should we not be just leaving these guys alone? What the hell is going on? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, so the military, having that perspective and having that really neat insight as an intel analyst, mm. I think really hastened my awakening as opposed to stunted it. But unfortunately... Most in the military have the opposite effect. They just kind of get consumed by the propaganda because, you know, to admit that what you're doing is supporting aggression and evil on a massive scale creates a lot of cognitive dissonance. Oh, yeah. So you have, to, oh, yeah. you have to rationalize that some way if you want to not just live with yourself, but even be proud of yourself. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Did, 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 you, uh, did you see the movie uh, The American Sniper? 
No, I haven't. I, I have not seen that. <laughs> is, is that a, out of some disgust for for what it what it's about, or or just having gotten a chance to it? I just yeah, I I just don't feel the particular <laughs> desire to go. Right. You know, watch two hours of American nationalist propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, me too. I, I haven't seen it either, uh, but I think I've I know I can I, you know I know pretty much what it's about completely because of what so many people have said about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, like like that like I, I heard that that Clint Eastwood, who directed the movie, was actually uh, he's actually slightly libertarian, you know. Um, but so so the way he he made the movie was not really to promote nationalism, from what I understand. It was to promote or to to demonstrate the horrors of war. You know, because mm-hmm. he showed all the all the gruesome details. He showed, you know, um, Chris Kyle shooting down, you know, kids and women, and uh, and so it, it, I think it, he tried to incite disgust for uh, for the war on terror in the population. And interestingly enough, in some people who were fiercely nationalistic, it had the complete opposite. <laughs> it strengthened their yes. nationalism, right? <laughs> Their resolve, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I did, however, watch um, the Adam Kokesh interview a bunch of people after watching that movie. Like, he went to the movie theaters, and after yeah. they come out of the movie right, theater, right. he he interviewed them and asked them some questions, and right. and kind of do the Socratic method to make them come to some right. somewhat reasonable uh, conclusions, and it was really entertaining. <laughs> You know, you know what I get when I when I talk to people like that, like you know, the very simple question, like uh, Larkin Rose, uh, he's like, um, you know, you can't, um, as I say, um, you know, you, you, it's immoral for you for you to rob your neighbor, right? So it's immoral for a group of you to rob your neighbor. What about if if you vote for a do- for for a politician to rob your neighbor? Is it, mm-hmm. is it still more, you know? And I say that kind of simple line of questioning, and I get so often people say, you know, you're overgeneralizing, you're oversimplifying. Life is more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say it's always the necessary evil argument you get back to that. Like, there. well, it's, well, you know, it does suck, but it's, it's what needs to be done if we want to maintain an orderly society, uh, a civilization. We're going to have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, you know. That's always kind of the, the retort, you know. Yeah. That's that- kind of why I wanted to address a lot of those practical comebacks. Like, actually, no. You're, this is actually a bad way to make an omelet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and also, um, you know, aside from the necessary evil, it's, it's also an appeal to authority. It's like I don't know. I, I it's impossible for me, the plebeian, you know, the simpleton, the peasant, to understand economics. So I'm just gonna leave it to the the, the experts in government. And, you know, they, you know, the 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 the, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I'm sure he knows what he's doing. <laughs> oh yeah. With the currency, let's just leave it to him. Stop trying, stop trying to ration it out for yourself. Don't try. It. <laughs> well, you know that's funny. That that that's a, uh, a complaint that many Austrians have of mainstream econ- uh, economics, whether it's Keynesian or even Chicago school, mm-hmm. is that they they joke that the more obscure you make your findings and your research, the the more recognition it gets. You know, because they people tend to all too often equate obscurity with profundity and mm. and truth and it's right, just right, right. no it, that, that that's not true and uh, most economics the even just the method the methodology they use for their analysis is just fundamentally flawed and that's what's so cool about Austrian economics because it's logically deductive from incontrovertible starting points it's all very sensible and unfortunately like you said all this propaganda has made people believe well Gosh, that just makes too much sense. That can't be right because <laughs> can't be right, yeah. because it makes too much sense because <laughs> it sounds too simple. This can't be right. That sounds to it mu- it's got to be more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah. If I don't understand it, then it's probably right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, so. If I'm confused, that's a good sign. <laughs> so that's that's the double thing they've they've installed in us, and it's the same with politics and everything else. Um, if they try to obfuscate or or make it. All this word salad, very yeah, yeah. incoherent language. They're probably trying to distract you from from the the reality of the situation. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and like you know, you know, we, we tell people, you know, no, actually, the minimum wage causes more unemployment, destroys, you know, the uh, the, the the less skilled, you know, they have they have less ability to you know start in the job world and and gain experience. And they're like, you know what? If Obama thinks that the fifteen dollar minimum wage is gonna help, you know, the uh, the poor. 
then I think he's right because he has good intentions and he probably knows <laughs> what he's doing because he went up there and he was very forceful and clear in what he said. So I think... <laughs> now let me be clear. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah, you're, you're right. It's just, it's, it's really amazing how, you know, people, they, they, they don't like to acknowledge uh, their own thought processes. You know, they, they mm -hmm. doubt the simplicity like you know i love einstein's quote you know if you don't if you can't explain it simply and you, you don't understand it well enough sure <laughs> and, absolutely and i i constantly say that to people because um you're right like austrian economics is really awesome in that regard is that you know it's based on human action right and incentives what are people incentivized to do in a certain situation right and uh and if we look in history you know a lot of things repeat you know there there are, there's a lot of repetition uh, mm -hmm. and if you're really careful with the way you study human action you can barely you can basically deduce how people will act it's not to say you can predict the future but you do have a general idea right <laughs> We don't need sure. we don't need a formula to figure out you know how the minimum wage will you know bring in more automation <laughs> into McDonald's. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, but you know of course of course however it it's really easy to promise people the world and and, and free college and free healthcare and, oh and more pay. It's, those are easy ways to to um, buy more votes. Oh. Yeah. And you don't even have to follow through on these promises. So they're free. They're e <laughs> yeah. I don't even have to actually give you. I can just promise it to you and you'll All vote right. for me and say, right. fuck you. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I, you know if, if you get the uh, $15 minimm wage, even if it passes, I'm still screwing most of you out of job altogether. You right, know? Right, right, Some right. of you might benefit and might be lucky enough to to uh, be seen as worth more than $15 an hour. Right. But most of you, you're going to be unemployed and it's going to be even harder to find a job. I mean, it's, uh -huh. it, it, it's, it's so crazy. It, it really is. And um, of course, when you object to these things, people just think, oh, you're just being selfish and greedy. You, you, you just think that uh, these aristocrats or, or these oligarchs, these greedy capitalists, you know, they're getting millions of dollars in bonuses. You know, why can't these guys just make a few more dollars an hour? It's, uh -huh. it's not about that. It's not about that. <laughs> it, it's about the employer can only pay them less than what they produce. If they pay them more than what they produce, then they're losing money. They're losing value. That's that destroys value. That's that's bad for everyone mm -hmm. in the long run. Oh yeah, See, it's, it's crazy. you just reminded me of Bernie Sanders with the free health care, free college, free everything. Oh yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> what a, what a great political platform! You know? right. I'm just gonna run on the I'm gonna run on the campaign promise that if you elect me, everyone's gonna be twice as handsome, twice as beautiful. You're gonna live <laughs> twice as long. You can eat whatever you want, not gain a pound. I'll make right. a law stating that explicitly. So if that happens, it'll be illegal. It'll so. be illegal. Right, because because <laughs> once you make something illegal, it does not happen, right? We just, exactly. We need to eliminate rape. Just make it illegal. No, of course, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, these politicians like they 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 <laughs> pander they pander to the base desires, base instincts of the people. You yeah, know, you know. Of course, you know everybody wants something for free. We all everybody's looking for a bargain. But then you know people, you got to realize what you know economic reality. Like wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Somebody had to work for that thing, right? So then, oh, how yeah. am I getting it for free? <laughs> no, no, you can pick education off of an apple tree. You know, it's right along there. Right, right, right. And, 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 and the other funny part is like you know, as, as all these socialist countries, you know, in the eurozone and and Puerto Rico and various places are collapsing, you know, we have a socialist candidate come to power, and he's like garnering all this support. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I, I really do hope, I know, I know I'm kind of digressing here, but I really do hope that, that Bernie Sanders does get elected president because the ship is going down no matter what at this right, point. Right, 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 right. So when it does, I want a very explicitly socialist at the helm. So maybe, just maybe people will finally wake up and say, wait a minute, maybe this is not a good idea. You know, if you have Rand Paul at the helm, of course, when the ship goes down, even though it's because of everything else right. that's been happening yeah. the last couple hundred years, right, right, right. they're going to blame it on free markets and quasi-libertarians or whatever. <laughs> so Yeah, that's a really good point. Like like um, Adam Kokesh uh, is, is running for president in 2020. There's a guy, Daryl Perry, running in 2016 also um, on the, like, yeah, dissolve the federal government. Uh, platform and you're right like like what happens if he does get elected although I, I really don't think that he will be but you know if he really if he does you're right like people will blame everything that's going to be happening <laughs> under his oh, yeah. rule as if and, that, and that's the other funny part is like one guy 
on the top is blamed for every single thing that happens in a complicated, you, you know, diverse economy <laughs> with billions of people transacting, you know, billions yeah. of transactions. And that guy was responsible for all of it, right? Is that, is that what you're telling me? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy because, you know, <laughs> the, the reality of it is that the president himself is really responsible for very little of it because he's just a puppet. Right, he's right. just a puppet. He's just a figurehead. That's yeah. why no matter who's in there, no matter what they promise, government always gets bigger in all areas debt always increases mm. war always perpetuates it doesn't matter who's in there it, it's the guy is just a puppet he's there to take all of the blame so you're looking at him while the the puppet masters are really out of sight out of mind right, right, somewhere right. else right, right, right. <laughs> so anyways right. like the, like, the, like, the, like, the, like the like the wizard of oz you know the guy behind the curtain and then <laughs> you see the big oh, yeah. uh, you see the big phantasm the big uh, hallucination but, That's right. Uh, but yeah. Thanks, yes. Obama. Yeah. <laughs> right. You didn't you didn't build that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, sure. that was the um I think that was that was Hillary. Uh, like Hillary said, uh, what did she say? That uh don't let anybody tell you that, that businesses um what did she say, produce wealth or something like that or Ma- or or make things or something like or create well something like that. <laughs> don't, oh, don't, or, or cre- oh no no create jobs that's it. Don't let her, don't let everyone tell you that businesses create jobs something like. That. Uh, well, <laughs> well, let's let's test that theory, Hillary. Let's eliminate all the businesses and see how many jobs are left. <laughs> right. I'm just gonna make a law that we need this number of jobs yeah. by this year, and it shall be done. <laughs> oh jeez. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. So so um, I don't want to keep you any longer. But uh, can you? Plug your um, your website, your book once again before we uh, before we sign off. Yes, uh, the book is called A Spontaneous Order: The Capitalist Case for a Stateless Society. You can find it on Amazon right now, and very soon I'll be launching a website for it as well called aspontaneousorder.com. You can learn more about the Blue Ridge Liberty Project on Facebook, as well as through our website at www.brlp.org and you can find my YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash ancapchase. Uh, very shortly here I'll be releasing more videos which correspond with each chapter of my book so look forward to that and I think that just about covers it. Awesome. Uh, so before we go, um, I'd like to ask this of, uh, of a lot of my guests. Um, if you were to meet somebody that um, you know maybe is uh, considering libertarianism or, or volunteerism or is on the fence about it, you know, what would you tell that person to to help them um, understand it more or <laughs> or change their views? What, what would you What would you say if they were wanting to, or or just interested in learning and and you know considering it on the fence, you know about not unsure, you know what what is. Oh. Well, I'm biased. I'd say read my book. <laughs> <laughs> read, read my book and come back to me in a few weeks, and then we'll talk. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Most efficient way. <laughs> or you can send them to your, your, your website. I mean, your, your YouTube channel. You've got a lot of great, great, there you go. great content on there, too. So. Yep. I All hate right. reinventing the wheel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Very true. All right. Awesome conversation, uh, Christopher. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, Danilo. So this is um, so. By the way, if you want to donate to um, to my uh, channel to help us out, because uh, you know freedom is wonderful, but uh, it's certainly not free because it requires resources. <laughs> um, you can donate Bitcoin or um, or PayPal. Um, I'll be uh, I'm still working on my Patreon. Got to get that set up. I'm uh, I'm a victim of uh, procrastination. So uh, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> but uh, awesome conversation, uh, Christopher. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, so this is uh, Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and uh, theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.